only four chapters, but we are going to be splitting Jonah chapter four into two parts. Today and next week are going to be looking at Jonah chapter four. And uh, we've seen Jonah kind of go through a roller coaster so far at this point. And uh, he was eventually able to arise and was eventually able to go. And now we see the aftermath of everything uh, going on now uh, as we go through the book of Jonah. And to start here today, I wanted to just remind us again on this path, because again, this is a story. This is a literally a historic event of what took place uh, thousands of years ago through this man and through this people group that he was called to minister to. So again, I just want to take our, our minds back to more specifically last Sunday of looking at what we had going on here in chapter 3, because we're in chapter 4 today. So if you recall, uh, Jonah, he finally got to Nineveh. He finally listened to God and his calling on his life to go and to the preach uh, God as creator and uh, also preach a message of warning on behalf of God of what would happen if these Ninevite people didn't turn from their evil. And the end result of this preaching that we see on the screen here, that the people believed God, right? They, they believed Jonah, and they believed that Jonah was sent by God, and they turned their eyes and their hearts back to God and embraced him as their creator and him as the one who gives morality to them. And the king as well was one who was believed. And that really much, having the king, the highest leader of the land, turning to God, that really served as an encouragement to the people to turn to God. Because, as he mentioned and how chapter 3 closed, maybe, just maybe, God will relent of the judgment that was to come. And yes, that's what happened. God did relent that judgment that was supposed to come. And now this chapter 4 is going to be essentially entirely about Jonah's response to that reality. Jonah's response to the reality that God relented and did not bring judgment on the Ninevite people because they turned their eyes to God because of Jonah's preaching that we see right here. And before we start, I want to remind us of a very psychological, yet very spiritual and very scripturally based reality that I know I've shared before behind the pulpit. This is very simple. What we fill our mind with will translate down to our hearts. I'll say it again. What we fill our mind with will translate down into our hearts. If we look at the book of Romans, uh, one of Paul's famous letters, the book of Romans chapter 1, chapter 1 is all about uh, the evil, diabolical uh, sins that, of course, the, the Gentile people are embracing and, and getting themselves into. And he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So think about that. Futile, worthless, silliness, right? Things that don't make sense uh, down this path of not walking with the Lord in mind and thought, going down the path of sin. It starts with their thinking, Paul says. And the next steps is their hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. This is one of many examples in the scripture where we see that pattern. But think about it. What we fill our minds with, right? If we think, fill our minds with the word of God, we fill our minds with thinking about how to better love our friends, better love our family, our neighbors, and God himself. Our hearts will naturally reflect that. And if we fill our minds with sin, or hate, or racism, or anything we can think of that is not of God, if we fill our minds with that kind of stuff up here, where do you think our hearts are going to be? Our hearts are going to be invested into those sins. And if we want to take it a step further, we can even say there's a third step to all this. And this third step is action, right? What we fill with our minds to our hearts then gets lived out in action, carried out in action. And after realizing here that now God was going to relent Nineveh of their sins, Jonah's response was anger. Anger that God could and would show mercy to his enemies. And that anger that started in his mind 
certainly translated into his heart. And there's so, so much to learn here from Jonah's response to this. So much to learn about the character of God when put in a situation like this. And again, I want us to see so much application to all of us. I want us to get as much application for what we read about and put it into our own lives. And I think the best way to do that is how I started this sermon series three weeks ago of looking at uh, a mirror. Right? Jonah serves as a mirror. So when we're looking and looking at Jonah's responses and we're hearing how Jonah reacted and his tone of voice and his mentality to everything we read about here this morning, I want us to take a look in the mirror and picture ourselves in Jonah's shoes and be honest with ourselves of our own thinking and our own heart as we read this. So turn with me now to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. We're looking at verses 1 through 4. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee Tarshish? For I knew that you are a gracious God and a merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster? Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? So, knowing that his audience knowing that his enemy embraced the message that he preached to them. What's the language that we see here? It displeased, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. As a preacher who gets the opportunity to, to share each and every week and to teach the word of God each and every week, it makes me so excited and encouraged when you all listen and embrace the message that God has put on my heart to share with you. So many of you, if not everyone in this room, at least at one point, has told me, hey, that really, what you said at this part of the sermon, I really thought about that. That, that really uh, encouraged me today. Almost everyone in this room has done that to me over the past couple years, even the past couple months. Okay? It's so, so encouraging as a preacher to hear those words. But here, Jonah is upset that the people listen to his own preaching. I was hoping I got some laughs here. Yes! Putting ourselves in Jonah's shoes. Our first thought could have and should have been, wow, an entire group of people are saved and get to know God because of God working through me. This is so, so encouraging. So with the opposite being true is that he was upset the people actually listen to the message, it kind of just goes our, over our heads of, wow, this is just crazy. This is so silly. This is so foolish. A person's mindset can be a powerful thing. An interesting thing, but yet a very powerful thing. And I'm sure all of us in this room have been around someone whose negativity just maybe sucks the life out of an entire room. It can be just horrible to be around because that type of thinking can be contagious. Right? You yourself start to get maybe negative. Not only negative, but maybe angry, as Jonah was angry that this was true. And in this specific situation, I don't think Jonah was around others, maybe include them in on his pity party here. This is a pretty lonely point for Jonah. But we get the picture of where his mind was, where his attitude was that reflected his heart, okay? A lonely part in, of, of this ministry in this time. And his mind and attitude tell us that Jonah certainly has a lot to learn about. Even though he's a prophet from God, even though God is using him for such a great task like this, he still has a lot to learn. Because remember, at this point, Jonah went where he was supposed to go. He preached the message that he was supposed to preach. Yet in his mind, he and God weren't on the same page. 
he at this time had some lessons that he needed to learn. And don't we sometimes think we know everything, but in reality, we ourselves have a lot to learn. And when picturing ourselves in Jonah's shoes, again, here's where the mirror comes into play. I can't stress enough this picture right here of how lonely of a moment this was for him, how much of an intense moment it was for him. Because I really don't think words in our Bible can, can pop, possibly do justice to describe his mental, his spiritual agony that was going through this time. And really what I mean here is that this distress that he's going through here, right here, is enough for him to be done with life together. We get that in our text here. Jonah wanted so badly for his enemies to experience distress that it actually caused distress in his own mind and his head. Right? Think about that. Think of this is what the picture that we get here is we get loneliness, we get agony, we get distress, anger, all of these emotions bottling up inside of us that really, ultimately, he wants his enemy to experience this, but it's backfiring going on. Just really interesting here, really interesting thing. And this happens too when our eyes and our mind aren't in a good place. It goes back to the next step and that it becomes a heart issue. This is the dangers and the, the kind of extreme situation and scenario of how dark our thinking can get. How dreadful and lonely our mind can take us. And the next step in that is our heart, too. It becomes a heart issue for us. And as we see in our text here, however, this anger and this mental agony wasn't justified. And so many times we try to justify our thinking. And how many times do we try to justify our thinking to ourselves and to God? Right? We're lucky sometimes God doesn't smack us over the head sometimes, right? With how jealous we can get of others. Right? How selfish we can get with our own intentions and our own desires. And how selfish we can get of so many of us sometimes are never content with the life that God gives us. Always looking for something next, something better. Not content with the beauty and the beautiful people that God's placed us in our lives. But by the grace of God, we know that God doesn't smack us over the head, right? Instead, he stretches out his arms, his compassionate arms, his compassionate hands, and he teaches us. He corrects us, and he helps us to see the beauty of living in this life and what it means to experience his sovereignty. We're lucky God isn't fair. And if we look back to verse 2 of our text, we can really see where Jonah's heart was when talking to God. And we see here, he prayed this prayer to the Lord, and he says, Oh Lord, is it not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love relenting from disaster. So we can see where his heart was now too. We already saw where his mind was and the loneliness, but now here's the connection to his heart. And we can see here that he recognizes these great attributes. He knows the character and the nature of God. This is a good thing, right? He knows that God is full of grace. He's full of mercy. That's why he was afraid to tell the people of Nineveh the message. Because he was afraid that this exact scenario that's happening right now before his eyes would come true. And it did come true. That the people of Nineveh would repent after hearing the message that Jonah preached to them. And that fear of this situation coming true is exactly why he refused to go to Nineveh in the first place. It's exactly why he jumped on the ship to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. Because he knew that God was a God of grace and mercy and didn't want the people to experience that, right? Because he didn't want his enemy to repent and only experience the mercy and grace of God. Jonah wanted the Ninevites to only experience the justice and the judgment and the wrath of God 
Remember last week and in the week before that, I closed every message with looking and sharing at how Jonah does such a great job of explaining and justifying that God can be and is a God of mercy, but also a God of justice. Jonah has such a hard time throughout this book reconciling the two. How can he possibly be both? I know he's one, but why won't he show the other? That's a pretty selfish mindset if I've ever heard one. Jonah's someone who recognizes the beauty of God recognizes that these attributes of God are true. But he doesn't want his enemy to experience this true side of God. Even after he himself experienced them. Let's explore that thought for a moment. Because of course Jonah knows all about the grace and all about the mercy of God. Because remember, he got swallowed up by the big fish. Remember, he experienced the glorious attributes of God inside the fish. He remembered God showing Jonah that he is a God of second chances, with bringing him safely to Nineveh to live out the plans that God had for him in his life. He experienced this side of God. What he just said is God, but yet he doesn't want others to experience the same side of God that he did which is the beautiful side. And I've been saying all along, when your mind isn't in the right place, neither will your heart. That's certainly the case here for Jonah up to this point. And going down memory lane in Jonah's life up to this point, it helps us see that Jonah himself called on the mercy of God and enjoyed the mercy of God when it was extended to him. He enjoyed that this was a part of who God is. He loved that God was a God of mercy and grace because who wouldn't, right? None of us would be here today at Grace Church if we didn't believe that God is a God of grace. And even though he loves that God is these attributes, he hates the fact that it can be extended to even his enemies. Another rhetorical question I want us to think about here is what if God treated Jonah the way Jonah wanted God to treat the people of Nineveh? Just a, just a thought for us to think of here. Because, I mean, didn't, the, even, didn't this even cross Jonah's mind? I mean, I was going to mention this in my sermon. Like, that was the first thing I knew last week, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question next Sunday. I'm asking it right now. But Jonah had never crossed his mind. Or maybe he, it didn't cross his mind because he was so focused on his own pity party inside of his head that he failed to make these simple connections and to ask these simple rhetorical questions. I think he was probably doing that second option. So invested in his own pity party that he didn't even want to think outside the box here. In this frame of mind, it isn't good. Let's remember, Jonah, again, he's a mirror for our own lives. So we have to ask ourselves, do we ever get so invested in our own pity party that we fail to ask ourselves this question? What if God treated me the way that I wanted God to treat the people of fill in the blank? Do we love that God is a God of grace and mercy? But deep down, hope that those who have wronged us in government, those who have wronged us in the opposite political party as we, do we think that and hope deep down that they experience the wrath and the judgment of God and hope that they don't experience the grace and the mercy? Just a thought. Because then in this chapter, if that is the case, then this chapter in Jonas should certainly wake us up. Earlier this week, I was doing as much research as I, as I could on Jonah chapter 4, because this is just such a great one. It's so applicable to our lives. You don't get that so, so often in, in some of these Old Testament books, but we certainly, certainly get that in Jonah. And I came across, doing some research on Jonah chapter 4, of an old poem, uh, a satire humor poem from Ireland in the 16th century. Okay, how many of you love satire humor from the 16th century? Yeah, yeah, we got a few hands. I like it. I like it. I'm going to share this simple, simple poem 
with you all because this poem is satire humor that looks at Jonah's mindset in chapter four. Jonah's mind is the inspiration for this poem. Jonathan Swift, he says, we are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. This was Jonah's frame of mind. We can laugh at it because it's so foolish. This is where his head and his heart led him. And because he let himself go so far down this path, he tells God in verse 3 to please take this life from him. For it's better to me to die than live. And that's, that's a pretty dark place too. There's nothing that can really get darker than that. To rather die than see the people you hate experience love and forgiveness from the same God who gave you love and forgiveness. And I want to simply remind us here, this isn't a new Jonah. This is the same Jonah that we saw in chapter one, fleeing because of fear of failure. Not fear of failure, but instead fear of success. Fear that going to Nineveh would find him in the exact mental and spiritual shape that he is here in chapter four. Angry and hateful that we, of course, know is unjustifiable. And uh, I think the best thing for us to do and look to at now this point here in our message is God's reaction to all of this. We've only looked at Jonah's mind. Now we've looked at Jonah's heart. Well, where does God's role play into any of this? Okay. And God's reaction to this is going to be important because Jonah here is he's mindless and he's heartless. So, such a simple, simple question that God asks, but it's so, so powerful. In the ESV, it's, do you do well to be angry? Or essentially what this is, is, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? Is this okay? Is this okay, Jonah? No, really, think about this. Is this anger actually justifiable? Is this, is this okay what you're doing right now? Is this good? I think God likes to ask these questions and these types of questions because they reveal our hearts. Now, is it right for you to be angry? Whatever Jonah's response is, whatever our response is, when we are, find ourselves in a Jonah-like situation like this, our answer to this question is so important because it reveals our heart. It, it, it shows where our heart is invested in. Let's be honest in our assessment of Jonah here. Let's give credit where credit is due. Jonah was honest in his plea for why he was angry, why he was upset. And we do know that honesty is a good virtue to have. But we can't think for a minute here or for a second that all of the honesty that Jonah just threw flat out for us to read here, that these emotions can be justified. Good that you're being honest, Jonah, but not good if you think that this makes you still in the right. And that was Jonah's big mistake. He actually thought he was in the right here. But again, with the question that God asks, is it right for you to be angry? He wants Jonah to think. He wants him to use his brain because using his brain will be a reflection of his heart. And think about in the New Testament, when questions were asked in order for the recipient to use their brain which ultimately reveals where their hearts are. I think of the story with Jesus. After he fed the 5,000 people, people were chanting, Messiah, Messiah, King of Israel. And later that night, he's around with the 12. And Jesus asks, who do you think that I am? And the first answer was, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the next great prophet. Come to rescue us, the people of Israel. What does Jesus say? He says, I'm not really concerned about what they think. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Think of Saul before he's Paul, right? On the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Very important story in our, in our theology. 
Saul, whom are you persecuting? Who art thou, Lord? Right? When we find ourselves in our own mind and our hearts opposed with God's will and his attributes, the question of, is it right for me to be angry? It's a good one to ask. This indeed is a question that we should ask ourselves when our ability to be angry is stronger than our ability to use reason and common sense and logic. When we're so angry and our head is in such a dark place and we can't use logic, let's ask the simple question. Is it right for you to be angry? And if we do that, I think most of the time the answer is going to be no. No, Lord. Your abounding love is always true. Your abounding love is always just, even when I can't see it. And Jonah 4 leads me, hopefully you, to ask myself and hopefully ask yourself, what do I truly believe about God and others? What do I truly believe about my enemies and God's role in their life just as much as God's role in my life? Do I really believe that God is a God of mercy and justice? Do I really want all people to experience the love and the grace and the forgiveness that I've experienced? I had to ask myself this this week. And I've come to the conclusion that yes, I, I do. But I only do for one thing and one reason only. Because I see his son on the cross. I see the mercy and the justice of God reconciled at the cross. I see Christ dying not just for my sins, but for all sins. I see that sin is the problem in my life, the problem in your life, the problem of my enemy's life, the problem in all of our lives. And that's the bad news. The bad news is that we're all sinners. But the good news is that Jesus died for sinners. Right? All of us have sinned, not just by choice and action. All of us have done something to wrong God, right? If it's with our thoughts, if it's within our minds, with our hearts, with our action, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, either here, here, or here. All have sinned and fallen short of glory. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's the good news. The good news is that Christ died for our sins. That he was buried and that he rose again. And we call this the gospel, the very good news of salvation. Okay, because now we have the opportunity to walk in his grace, walk in his mercy, walk in his love, walk and show forgiveness of others because God has shown us that at the cross. The cross changes everything. The cross changes not just the here and the now. It certainly changes the here and the now. It changes us and transforms us to be like him but it also changes our future. It changes our de destiny. We can't change our past. But we can determine our destiny by choosing Christ. But Christ can change our past because dying on the cross, all our sins have been forgiven. forgiven. So we can't change our past, but Christ can change our past. We can't determine our future in our own flesh, but Christ can because eternity is with him if we put our faith in the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. There's so many passages in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul lays out the gospel clearly and boldly for us of the power of not only the cross, but the power of the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the dead and that we can live a life rising out of our sin, rising out of our own grave and live for him. That's the beautiful reality of the gospel. But in the New Testament, there's so many passages where Paul reflects on his own life, reflects on his own sin and his own sinful heart of persecuting other Christians, having hate in his mind and his heart for his enemies. But how he experienced the grace and the mercy of God and how that transformed him. There's a passage of scripture I love, love so dearly. It's in the book of Titus. It's in Titus chapter 3. If, you're, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there briefly. I just, I just thought of doing this right now. I have the, the last part on the screen here. In a moment, I'll share. But uh, in Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 
2, sorry, verse 3, Titus 3, verse 3, Paul lays out the past. He lays out the fact that we ourselves were once foolish. Any fools in the house today, right? Once fools, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, envy, hatred of others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of Christ our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of our good works or anything we've done, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit that he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So becoming justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is what I want our minds to remember. We once were fools. We all got fools in the house. Once disobedient. Once had hate. This is our life before Christ. But now we can breathe and say, he saved us. Not because of the wretched things we had done, but because of his own mercy. Jonah was living his life in the hate. We ourselves lived our life in the hate and the disobedience. But now Jonah has an opportunity to now look to the reality and the beauty of God, of the mercy of God, embracing what he knows to already be true about God, but embracing his own life. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God's grace, that, he has the, that we all in this room have the ability to choose Christ because of what he has done for us. We all have this opportunity in this room to now get on this path of his love, of his mercy, and of his grace, because the cross allows us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that the cross teaches us so many things. And as I've mentioned throughout this sermon series before, the greatest thing that the cross can show us is that love and mercy, but also justice, can still coexist. And we're thankful for this truth. Hearts of knowledge should be transformed to have grace, mercy, and truth. I pray that this isn't just something we see and believe with our mind. But Father, I pray that these things translate to our heart now. Just as we can fill our mind with bad and sinful stuff, we can still fill our mind with good and righteous and true stuff, which will translate to our hearts and actions here in this age of grace that we live. Father, thank you for our church family here that we have an opportunity each and every Sunday to worship you, to be challenged by your word. And Father, to leave these doors to change people that want to live out this truth in their lives. Father, thank you for the gift of the local church. Thank you for salvation, giving us freely and boldly. In your name we pray. Yes, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a few verses.